Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank everyone for being here today. We are joined by some of the most important leaders uh, in the state of Colorado, and we're so very excited to have with us today the Secretary of Energy, Dan Briette. Uh, my name is Mike Summers. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm President and CEO of the American Petroleum Institute in Washington, D.C. We proudly represent America's natural gas and oil companies uh, throughout the United States. Uh, today, with a coalition from government, labor, and business, we're looking forward to discussing three key Colorado issues that resonate here in the Rocky Mountains, but also apply all across America. We'll talk about why energy infrastructure is critical to America's current and future success. We'll discuss the critical contributions and the roles of American-made energy in combating climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we'll specify how the energy industry plans to power America's economic recovery. Uh, our roundtable participants, uh, I want to thank you for, for being here today. Uh, we have actually someone all the way from New Mexico as well, the mayor of Artesia, New Mexico, who drove up uh, for, for eight hours to, to get here today to join us. Uh, and uh, I want to thank everyone also um, for abiding by uh, Colorado's uh, social distancing guidelines and, and uh, uh, the, the mask mandate uh, from your governor. Um, as everyone knows, beating the coronavirus is the single most important way that we can rebuild our economy and get our nation back to work. Along with our distinguished panel, I'm honored to be joined by the United States Secretary of Energy, Dan Briette, a leader who truly understands the important partnership between industry and government. Prior to his current role, Secretary Briette built up three decades of experience in both public and private sectors. As an industry, we're fortunate to work with a Department of Energy that recognizes the value that natural gas and oil provides to society, as well as the role it will play in, in America's economic recovery. Uh, Secretary Briette leads a distinguished team that instinctively knows that states like Colorado, America's seventh largest, largest energy producer, are the building blocks for us to embark on a comprehensive national comeback powered by U.S. natural gas and oil. With that, I'd also like to thank uh, API's Energy Citizens who are joining us in the live feed today. So thank you for uh, this grassroots network that is dedicated to advancing this industry and American energy independence. And with that, I'm excited to turn it over to Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mike, for that kind introduction. And uh, my name is Dan. That works just, just fine. Uh, thank you. Mike and I have known each other. We've run in the same... Uh, uh, friend circles, if you will, for the last, what, I don't know, 20 years, 25 years, give or take. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. We've worked on energy policy for a long time together. But thank you for the opportunity to join you here today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with all of you. Um, it's not lost on me on any given day the importance of the energy industry, uh, not only to Colorado, but to America uh, writ large. Uh, I'll just share with you a couple of quick uh, stories so that you understand a little bit more about who I am and where I come from. Uh, I was born and raised down in Louisiana, an energy producing state. One of my very first jobs was entirely dependent upon the energy industry. I grew up as a pipeline welder. So I know full well uh, what infrastructure means to this industry. I know full well uh, what a strong, healthy, and vibrant uh, energy industry does to a local economy as well as to a national economy. I'm going to steal one of Mike's lines because we were together just a few days ago uh, in another part of the country, not too far from here in Wyoming. <clears throat> and we like to talk about statistics. We have, you know, at the Department of Energy, the Energy Information Administration, EIA, as we refer to it. And there are lots of numbers on a page. One of the more important numbers is to understand uh, the importance of energy to the nation's GDP. It's roughly 8% of the GDP. But as Mike pointed out in the meeting that we were in, it's the first 8% of the nation's GDP. Because everything else that we do in America depends upon energy and the production of energy here in the United States. Uh, if we think what we're going through, think about what we're going through today as the nation deals with this pandemic, you know, we're, our lives are changing each and every day. We're teleworking more, we're telecommuting more, whatever proper adjective or word you want to use to describe this new life that we're using, you know, Zoom uh, meetings and working from home. Imagine trying to do that without electricity. Imagine trying to do that without Wi-Fi. Imagine what would happen in a major urban area like Denver or New York or Los Angeles or Miami 
uh, during this pandemic if the hospitals lost power? How would we deal with this? The nation depends upon the production of energy, not only for our economy, but I'll take the next step forward. It also, we also depend upon it for energy security as well as our national security. Uh, we told this story as well at the last meeting that we were in. Um, it wasn't that long ago uh, when I was growing up in Louisiana. I remember distinctly uh, sitting in the back seat of my dad's car as we waited in a line to buy gasoline. And I remember asking my dad, how can this possibly be, Dad? We're from Louisiana. You work in the energy industry. We produce oil. How, how is it that we're waiting in line to purchase gasoline? Well, at that point in time, I was too young to understand that the nation was completely dependent upon people in the Middle East to provide our energy needs, specifically our crude oil needs. We've gone so far from those days, it's even hard to imagine. And what that's done for us is not only open up economic opportunity here in the United States and created jobs for us here as Americans in the United States, it's provided this president and any future president with foreign policy options that were simply not available just a decade ago. And it's due to this industry. You know, it's not anything that we did at, at the government level, although I think we probably had some you know, role to play. But it's this industry that has provided that energy security and that national security. And the most prominent example of that is what happened uh, almost a year ago now uh, when the country of Iran decided to attack a major facility in Saudi Arabia, Abcake. Had that happened when I was growing up in Louisiana, you know, we would have seen gasoline prices shoot up 100, 200, 300 percent perhaps. It didn't happen this time. And the reason it didn't happen was because this industry has provided us with enough oil to meet our needs. And it's provided us with the energy security that allowed us to stabilize those markets very, very quickly. And that's the contribution that this industry makes to our energy security and our national security. I know that there are current issues that we have to deal with as a nation, however. Uh, you know, we've done a great job of producing more energy. Uh, one of our bigger challenges, however, is getting that product to marketplace. And what I mean by that is, going back to that first job I had, it's developing the infrastructure that we need to move the product from point A to point B. And importantly, getting it to the coast so that we can get it onto the open ocean and sell it all around the world. Um, that is going to be, you know, one of my focal points here. Uh, at the federal level, my authorities at the U.S. Department of Energy are not always aligned uh, with the needs. I mean, you probably well know, pipeline jurisdiction doesn't fall to me at the Department of Energy. It falls to another cabinet agency. But uh, I can use this platform to ensure that those other agencies understand the importance of their work to this industry itself. And I know that they do. I don't want to suggest that they don't. Uh, but you have my commitment to move forward uh, and articulate and it, it, uh, advocate uh, for the additional infrastructure that we, he we need here in the United States. Um, that's kind of an overview of what I think about the energy industry, what I think uh, is happening today. I know we could, we're going to get into a broader conversation, a more detailed conversation perhaps, about uh, some of the specifics uh, that are important to you uh, here in Colorado and New Mexico. Mayor, thanks for driving up. Uh, honored that you would do that. Uh, I think it's important that we come together at the state level uh, to understand what I might be able to do to help you uh, as you move forward. So, you know, thank you. Always good to see you, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We really appreciate your willingness to come here and, and see energy in action in the great state of Colorado. As I mentioned, we have an incredible uh, group of business leaders here uh, representing the state, uh, both Colorado and New Mexico, as we mentioned. So I want to make sure that we have a, a, a good amount of time for a, a roundtable discussion here. Mm -hmm. um, but before we jump into that, I, I'd make a couple of uh, opening remarks. Your, your, your point about the importance of energy infrastructure is just so key for this, inter, this industry going forward. Uh, Pre-pandemic, uh, the oil and gas industry in the United States was producing about 13 million barrels of oil every single day. Uh, or about 13% of the world's production, sure. of the world demands every single day. Uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, we were, uh, the world was consuming uh, about 100 million barrels of oil every single day. Um, at the depths of this pandemic, as the world economy was shutting down, the world was still using 70 million barrels every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, and the United States uh, continued to be uh, an energy leader throughout that mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, you think about where we were 
10 years ago when the United States was only producing 6 million barrels of oil every, every single day. Uh, we've doubled that you know, mm -hmm. because of uh, the innovation that has come from this industry. Mm -hmm. Imagine the place that we would be in if we were still dependent on foreign energy during this pandemic. It would have made this so much, so much worse. Uh, the problem that we have now is that while the United States can continue to supply the world with energy, uh, there are many activists who are trying to cut off that supply and mm -hmm. prevent the United States from building this critical energy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, we know the demand is still gonna be there based on what we've seen throughout this pandemic. Um, and we know that the United States energy workers can supply that need um, through hard work and ingenuity. But activists are trying to stand on the hose in the middle um, and prevent that energy from getting from where it is to where it's needed. Uh, so your help and support on advancing energy infrastructure so that we can get our products to market is gonna be so very uh, important. You also mentioned, I think, a, a really key component of this as well. Our national security environment has completely changed as a consequence of American energy leadership. Uh, you mentioned the, the attacks in Iran and uh, uh, that oil prices, of course, spiked for one day and then came right back down because of uh, uh, American energy coming online. So I appreciate your, your focus on that as well. Um, but I, I think something that's, that's oftentimes overlooked, and I'm excited to hear from Gary Arnold from the Pipefitters Union about this, you know, a number of the, the jobs in this industry, first of all, are union jobs. They're good paying jobs. In fact, uh, the energy industry pays twice the national average in terms of, of wages uh, in this country. Uh, the average wage in the energy, energy industry is over $100,000 a year. These are middle-class sustaining jobs. And in fact, uh, the North America's Building Trade Union recently just did a study on this. And uh, they reported that union, union members prefer jobs in the oil and gas industry because they pay better, their benefits are better, and they last longer. So we have a great coalition with NAB2 and the United Association and LIUNA um, advancing our energy priorities. Uh, and we're really excited, Gary, that you could join us today to talk about the importance of these jobs uh, to your membership. So thank you for being here. And then, you know, I don't want to neglect how important our commitment is to the environment as well. You know, this is an industry that uh, every single year is taking steps to reduce emissions. Our emissions are at generational lows, even while uh, energy, the energy leadership in this country continues to grow. We've doubled We've doubled the amount of oil that we're producing in the United States and emissions have continued to go down every single year. That's an accomplishment, not that government mandated that. It was something that this industry did uh, to advance uh, our environmental performance. Um, you know, one other key thing that I'll mention, and I know you're familiar with this, Mr. Secretary, we have a program at the American Petroleum Institute called the Environmental Partnership. And this is a program of 86 uh, oil and gas companies that have come together to find new ways to reduce methane emissions. This is such an important environmental uh, focus of ours. We need to reduce our environmental footprint at all times. And this is a coalition of both big producers and small producers. They get together and they discuss ways to advance uh, new technologies to reduce methane emissions. And it's providing real tangible benefits uh, for American consumers and our, our member companies as well. So with that, Mr. Secretary, I wanna thank you again for your visit to Colorado. And I'm really excited uh, to have uh, business leaders and elected officials um, from Colorado and New Mexico talk about uh, this industry and how uh, all of us can better support its advancement going forward. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. If you don't mind, I'd just like to add on one quick point. I just wrote a note to myself because it reminded me of something. You know, as we, um, as we think about what we need to do in the future, and you mentioned, you know, some of the uh, activism that's occurring in, in the courts, uh, in the legislatures, you know, across the country, uh, that's preventing the development of this infrastructure. It's often around the, the notion that this industry is a dirty industry. Then there's another clean industry on the other side, and it's usually associated with renewable energy. I just left the Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory just down the street here, uh, talking to Dr. Martin Keller. And I'm always reminded, and, and, and Dr. Keller will tell you this as well, 
these two industries do in fact today go hand in glove. You know, the, the renewable industry, the provision of renewable energy uh, for the purposes of, of generating electricity, wind energy and solar energy, today is dependent upon the production of natural gas and the use of natural gas to produce electricity, base load electricity power. They go hand in glove. Until we reach a day in America that we have battery technologies that allow grid scale storage, which is not, you know, in the near term, we still have a ways to go. Uh, the renewable industry will be in fact dependent upon this industry. So we can't lose sight of that, you know, in the communications that we have, we can't lose sight of that in the legislative activities that we have. And I certainly won't lose sight of that uh, from the, you know, my position here as the US Secretary of Energy. So you just reminded me of that point having just left that laboratory. Thanks, Mike. With that, I'd love to open it up for any discussion. How about we uh, do a round of introductions um, for everyone? And uh, uh, please, uh, any opening remarks that you have uh, as we as we uh, have this conversation. So, Bree, do you want to start with? <laughs> it's like it's so it's like in school when you're just praying the teacher doesn't call on you first. <laughs> well, you were a teacher, so. <laughs> Teachers make the worst students. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm Representative Bree Buenteo. I represent House District 47, that's Pueblo, Fremont, and Otero counties, uh, Southern Colorado. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a former school teacher. Uh, I was elected in 2018 and happy to be here today. I think it's important that, um, you know, and I'm sure Senator Scott will agree with me uh, that we not lose sight of uh, state policies. Um, especially here in Colorado with the principle of local control. So. Well, uh, my name's Gary Arnold. I'm the business manager of Pipefitters Local 208 and excited to be part of the, the panel and the discussion with Mike and, and Mr. Secretary. Uh, I think you hit the, the nail on the head. Uh, the importance that, that oil and gas in the energy sector plays to good middle class family sustaining jobs uh, is critical. And, and when we uh, talk about policy and implementing policy, uh, understanding how that affects the markets and affects uh, working class folks' ability to go earn a living and provide for themselves and their family is, is a critical part of that conversation. So very excited to, to join the group and, and thank you for the invite. Tell me a little bit about your local though. Where, where are you at? Where are, you, are you here in Denver? So, so we're based here in Denver. We have 1,800 members. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them uh, are, are, most of our jurisdiction is like kind of the northeast third of the state. We go okay. just south of Castle Rock, north to the Wyoming border, and then from the Continental Divide east to the Kansas-Nebraska line. But another decent part of our membership is our members that work in our natural gas distribution agreement. Mm -hmm. And for the distribution agreement, those members, we cover the entire state of Colorado as well as the entire state of Wyoming. Uh, oh, I see. So fairly large uh, footprint. Yeah. and and a lot of hard work in men and women. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for that background. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, uh, Gary and I, when, when I was last here in March, uh, he gave me a great tour of, uh, of the local. Um, it, was, it was really interesting. And you know, one of the things I was excited about is they were, they were doing a, uh, classes on welding um, and they were uh, uh, teaching to the API welding standard. Um, as you know, API isn't just a, an advocacy organization, but it's an organization that sets standards for the worldwide oil and gas industry. So seeing those standards in action at, the, at, at Gary's local was really, really exciting. That's great. You get your start really as a, as a standard setting. Yes, that's uh, exactly right. right? So. And, we, and we were excited to show off the facility. Uh, the welders are trained to API 1104s as well as some of the more ASME codes, but mm -hmm. for, for a former pipeliner, uh, mm -hmm. definitely understand oh, yeah. uh, all the hard work that goes into that. So uh, oh, appreciate the bracket. Yeah. If I might also add, um, Mr. Arnold's union in particular is important here in Colorado. Um, the area that I represent, Pueblo, Fremont, and Otero counties, we've only just now recovered from the economic crash of 2009 before coronavirus hit. Yeah. So jobs that he represents um, and his union represent are more critical than ever, especially as we look to recover economically from this crisis. Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Andrew Browning. I'm a uh, president of Western States and Tribal Nations. Uh, we're uh, <clears throat> an organization was start, started out of a collaborative effort between um, then Governor John Hickenlooper's Colorado Energy Office and uh, the Utah Governor's Office of Energy Development in the Ute Tribe 
uh, to uh, put together a report that looked at looked at the um, the comparative advantage of Rockies natural gas to supply Asian markets. We looked at the you know the resource base, the the uh, infrastructure. Uh, and made a series of recommendations on the, the policy and regulatory and advo advocacy challenges uh, needed to be dealt with with the states taking a lead. So it's a, it also it called for establishment of a, a 501c4, um, Western States and Tribal Nations, and it's where we now have a, a collaborative effort with uh, a number of states who have signed the MOU, uh, state of Wyoming, uh, the state of Utah, state of New Mexico, uh, state of Baja, California, Mexico, the Ute tribe, uh, and then the, the Western Colorado counties of Garfield, uh, Mesa, Moffat, and Rio Blanco. And so uh, we're, we're tackling these issues that you, you mentioned head on. Uh, one of our first, uh, one of our primary efforts right now is to establish the technical baseline on uh, global emissions reductions, so really with a focus on the Asian uh, countries uh, as a result of increased uh, LNG use from uh, gas exported from North America's West Coast. So I'm we're knee deep in it, and I've got some a lot of talking points. If you guys want to talk it, uh, talk about it in the, I'd love to follow yeah. up with you on that. Um, we're going to be doing a study here very shortly at the DOE. We're using our um, our national laboratories to look at the um, thinking about your baseline, you know, for for carbon emissions and and uh, uh, emissions more broadly, perhaps even. Uh, we're going to look at the effects of this pandemic on the, on carbon reduction. I'd love to share some of that data with you, and perhaps work together. On uh, on our findings. Yeah, absolutely. Love yeah, to. That'd be great. Hi, my name is Lynn Granger. I'm the executive director for API State Office here in Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us. Um, this industry is is vital to our state. It's a cornerstone of our state's economy. I'm really looking forward to the discussion here this afternoon with um, our uh, business leaders in the state and New Mexico as well. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ray Miller. I have been uh, in the oil and gas industry for the last 40 years. I came to Artesia in 1980, and like yourself, I never have aspired to leave. It's been a great 40 years working in the industry. I've only been mayor for a few years in Artesia. Uh, politics is not my thing. Uh, it's a thing where I've been on the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association Executive Committee for multiple years. And uh, unfortunately, I'm also a proud uh, booster of the local Artesia High School football team, which is not playing this. Uh, and so our mental condition with this pandemic uh, without football is absolutely disastrous. <laughs> it's a thing where uh, we are blessed. We're on the northwest side of the Permian Basin, and it's been a tremendous uh, basin that's been developed multiple times over the years. And, uh, we continue to have great success and uh, the opportunities still abound for tremendous success in the future if we're allowed to uh, do it with uh, the environmental regulations that appear to be uh, becoming more and more stringent around this nation. I second your concern about football, by the way. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, um, Mr. Secretary and Mike. My name is Debbie Brown, and I'm the president of Colorado Business Roundtable. We're the state affiliate of the Business Roundtable uh, nationally. Uh, so we represent, we tend to represent some of America's larger employers here in Colorado, and we work on issues that not only affect Colorado, but also national issues and some international issues as it uh, pertains to trade, for example. Uh, we really believe that business is a force for good and that we're all interconnected. The reason business is good is because at the end of the day, we're employing people, providing products to people, supply chains affect people, and hopefully um, helping people live uh, their American dream. Uh, we are partners with API and feel like we're gonna be, uh, we continue to be incredibly strong allies for the oil and natural gas industry and realize that for our businesses to be successful, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, we need a strong, stable, accessible oil and natural gas industry to fuel the rest of the private industry that uh, does so much for our country and for Colorado. So very pleased to be here today and uh, to help represent other industries outside of oil and gas. 
Hi, good afternoon. Uh, so first to Mike uh, and thank you, Lynn, for including us in this opportunity. Um, the most important thing you need to know, Mr. Secretary, is my father was a welder on natural gas pipelines in Montana. Um, yeah, the, what that delivered to me is the largest vocabulary of four letter, letter words anyone has. Um, and so I'll do my best not to use it today. Um, it's quite okay. Uh, I probably know most of them, and, and, and my my problem, right. my problem was after I left that that part of my career, I went into the U.S. Army and I became a drill sergeant. So it only got worse right. from there. <laughs> I totally understand. Um, so I'm the president and CEO of the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. We've been in business for 153 years. Uh, we're the longest operating organization in the state of Colorado. Uh, my goal is just not to screw that up while I'm there. Um, uh, but when it comes to energy, what's interesting is with those 3,000 members we represent, they have 400,000 employees. And I would say, unfortunately, we have had the chance in Colorado to really educate them on this industry, the critical nature of this industry, and defend it so the industry is not the only group defending itself. Um, and that's uh, unfortunately been required. But I would also say has been su successful that people are starting to understand um, the linked nature of the work. I would say there's been two strategies for us. Uh, about 10 years ago, we said this notion that there's clean or renewable and that there's other energy is ridiculous. There's energy production. We're in the business of energy production in the state. We have been for a long time and we should be for a long time. So we created a venue by where our traditional energy providers and our renewable sources could come together and start talking and innovating um, and it has been hugely successful. And to remove the fighting uh, in intra-industry for uh, our community. Uh, the second notion that we just don't believe in is that you can either produce energy or you can protect your environment. And in Colorado, we think our companies are proving you can do both. Uh, and not only can you do both, but you can lead on how to do both. And we're extremely proud of the work our companies do in that regard. I'm excited to talk about some of that innovation and ensure more people are seeing it. So thank you for bringing us together. Really appreciate it. You, I'm glad you raised that. You know, growing up down in Louisiana, we, um, I knew firsthand just as a kid, you know, I used to see what the industry was doing firsthand. You know, we grew up sort of close to the Gulf of Mexico. We used to go fishing in the Gulf all the time. Best fishing in the world is off an oil rig. I mean, that's where you go to, to catch fish. And I used to see that every day. And I, I often got confused when, you know, years later, decades later, I end up in Washington, D.C. And this industry, industry is portrayed as this evil, you know, uh, destructive force, you know, to the environment. It was just so contrary to my personal experience, you know, it was shocking, to be honest. And I think, you know, perhaps together we need to, need to do a better job of telling that story. And uh, I don't have a perfect answer for you, but uh, know that I'm with you and I'll help you do that. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. And tell the president, for, you know, thank him for allowing you to leave DC for a day. That's, <laughs> it was very nice of him. Uh, I actually hail from Grand Junction, Colorado, Western Colorado, uh, the home of natural gas. That's pretty much what we are uh, in comparison to the Eastern Plains of Colorado. Uh, some of the things we've dealt with over the last 10 years of my tenure in the state legislature has been educating people on the fact of how important all this energy it just matters, quite frankly. Uh, Colorado's about $31 billion a year in revenues in all areas, direct and indirect. And it's been very difficult to keep that narrative where we wanted it to be. Uh, I think we're sixth in the, in, the, in the United States in natural gas production here in Colorado. Uh, and most of that is, is Western Slope gas. Our biggest problem, to Andrew's point, is that we've got to get that gas out of here. And it sounds like you're on that. And that's very, very important to us. Uh, and it's important to the world. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand is there's a world demand that's much different than what we believe it is in a local basis. Uh, we can really make a huge difference in China and India and other places that we can get the gas to. I'll never forget a discussion with the energy minister from Lithuania who was paying a ridiculous amount of money. I think it was $15 per thousand cubic feet. And we're sitting over here at a buck, buck and a quarter. And I'm thinking, I don't have to be an economics major to figure out we can make money doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Plus help get those people away from the Soviet bloc countries is where their supply was coming from. And that becomes that energy security thing you talked about. Uh, I think as we talk about those narratives moving forward, I think it's going to be very important that the American people especially understand that because it is so very important to us. And we go just to the pandemic right now. 
Uh, had we been dependent on somebody else for what our energy needs were, I, I can't even imagine where we would have been today. So your work is so important going forward. Uh, and I think there's always some misconception also that we don't believe from this industry, if you will, that we don't believe in all of the above approaches. But the difference when you talk renewables is we're talking an unreliable energy source versus a reliable energy source that we're used to for the last hundred years. So that's very important. I think that we start to keep getting that message out there. Uh, we can transition and we can mix those energies together and I think we'll be just fine. But we can't be Germany. We can't be paying three times more for our energy needs uh, and using a third of that energy produced by unreliables, if you will, uh, to, to be our primary source. It's just not gonna work. So thank you for the work you're doing and you will continue to do for the next four years. We appreciate that. Uh, and uh, look forward to, to working with you on several issues as we go forward. Uh, thank you for that, Senator. You, you, uh, the minister in Lithuania, Mr. Vikinius, is a very good friend of mine. We've, uh, we've had many good conversations over the course of the last year and a half, three years, I should say. Uh, I was a deputy secretary before, the, before I became the secretary, so I've known him for some time now. Uh, you know, the idea around Nord Stream 2, we, we have opposed Nord Stream 2 as a government um, for, I think, a very simple reason. I think the president probably said it best when he was over there at the NATO conference. He said, wait a minute, hold on. You know, I'm protecting you from these guys and you're buying your gas from these guys. How does this work? You know, you've become more dependent upon them and I'm supposed to pay to protect you from them? No way. That's not a good deal for the American taxpayer. And um, we stand by that. We, we believe in that. We think that we think that Europe has become overly dependent upon Gazprom and for the provision of natural gas. You know, we've been criticized for that position from, uh, you know, an economic standpoint. We think we have strong arguments on a, on a national security standpoint. Uh, we've been criticized, you know, about, uh, you know, the Germans in particular have said, well, you just want to sell more U.S. gas. Well, yes, we do, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, you know, Europe is an important market and we're a reliable supplier of natural gas. And uh, we do, we are interested in that market for our U.S. producers. You know, we have our own issues to fix, obviously, and we're gonna be at, you know, for a while, we may be at some competitive disadvantage because you have to transport the gas there. Our biggest challenge here is just getting the gas to the coast. Again, you know, it's, it's, it's the same issue we've dealt with now for a little while. I just authorized, uh, you know, the Jordan Cove facility out in Oregon. Uh, it's not lost upon me that that's not the end of the game and there's some other, you know, permitting uh, processes that have to happen to the state level. But I'm going to continue to push for that facility to be um, fully built because I think it's important that we have a, an export facility on the western coast of the United States. If we can't get it, I will continue to work with those companies that are interested in developing export facilities elsewhere, perhaps in Mexico. Uh, there are several companies who have approached me. Sempra has been one of the latest. Uh, you know, they are interested in, in uh, developing pipeline infrastructure that can move gas from Colorado, Texas, wherever it comes from, down to uh, the coast of Mexico so that we can serve those Asian markets who are begging for U.S. gas. And uh, I think it's important that we do this. You know, I have to ask one other question of the secretary. Do you know Senator A.G. Crow? I do not. He's, he's a Louisiana boy from yeah. Slidell. He just, I've Slidell. done some work with him. He's a, he's yeah. a character. I figured you might know him. Yeah. No, I, I, I've heard his name. I just don't know him personally. But, uh, Maybe that's good. Yeah. <laughs>Well, thank you everybody for the, the introductions. Uh, really, we wanna open this up for a discussion um, a, and uh, a really uh, thoughtful discussion on energy in Colorado and New Mexico and uh, how the Department of Energy can continue to advance uh, the, the energy revolution that we've seen over the course of the last 10 years. Um, so any thoughts that, that uh, anyone would like to provide to, to kick us off? Yeah, you know, I, I am, you know, thanks. Mike, I'm generally interested in your thoughts about what I can do um, you know, from my platform uh, to help you. Um, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be an expert on Colorado politics or New Mexico politics. Uh, I know you're not a politician, Mayor, but uh, for the moment, uh, I'm going to pick your political brain. <laughs> but, um, you know, from a policy standpoint, what is it, you know, at the, at the federal level that we can either do, uh, do better, or stop doing, uh, whatever the case may be? So I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Do we just jump in whenever, just sure. jump right in? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stick my foot right where I normally do. Um, Colorado is about 37% federal lands. My part of the woods is about 76% federal lands. So we have a huge chunk of federal property. 
Uh, we've had difficulty and we, we, we gained some traction with Secretary Bernhardt. I hate to tell you this, we're both from Rifle, Colorado. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know there's something in the water over there, but uh, trying to get some pushback because we have a lot of duplicative efforts on permitting uh, environmental issues on federal land. So if, a, if an operator needs to get a permit, they have to get a BLM permit first. And then secondarily, they have to get a state permit. But we've signed MOUs that have allowed then the state to be over that federal project or on that federal land. Uh, we did a lot of pushback. Andrew and I worked on this very hard last year. Uh, we didn't get, we kind of got a lot of traction, then it kind of stopped. So we could use some additional help getting a pushback against uh, overreach, if you will, or duplicative regulations, if you will, on federal properties. Uh, and it's, become a, it's becoming a bigger problem. And as we move into the future, and hopefully we're doing more exports. Yeah. Uh, we, so what's, what's Dave's reaction to your point, to your argument? I'm sorry. I'm well, what, what's Dave's reaction to your, your argument? I, I assume he's oh, supportive of where you want to go. Well, but, he, was, he was very supportive. I think there was yeah. some, some local pushback. <clears throat> I believe we all believe in states' rights, correct? Sure, yeah. Tenth can't. Amendment so matters. The Tenth Amendment's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what stopped things <laughs> a little bit in its tracks. Is just, yeah. I think there was a point where the MOU had, had expired, okay. but they renewed the MOU, but they did not put any more contingencies on it to roll back some of the regulation sure. or the permitting requirements. Sure. Uh, and that would be a huge relief for some of the operators on the western slope of Colorado. Sure. Because they are working on federal land, not private property, as, sure. as many of the other areas are working in. Sure. Uh, so I'm, happy to, I'm happy to talk to Dave about this and weigh in. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a former state regulator, so I've dealt with state leases and whatnot down in Louisiana. You then. You um, I can, I can app, you know, happily provide whatever insights, you know, might be helpful to him. Oh, that would be forward. great, because yeah. that's, that's one thing we really need some help on. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Okay. Um, I, I would actually like to commend uh, the administration on, you know, the, all the work that they've been doing promoting uh, LNG, our natural gas resources uh, abroad. I, I would say if you're asking us what you could do, keep, keep on doing it. Uh, you know, it is, um, you know, the United States is evolving as, as, a, as a key player uh, uh, for, for global markets. Um, you know, I got to believe vis-a-vis -vis some other countries that are pushing their exports uh, if you're if you're an Asian uh, LNG purchaser or government government, and you're looking at where to buy your LNG from, uh, uh, a Western democracy with uh, rule of law and sanctity of contracts is has a little bit of a comparative ad advantage. And so, uh, the the um, bully pulpits of the of the federal government, what we've kind of established at the state and local level, uh, I think that's it's invaluable in, in terms of engaging on behalf of of industries and and. And, and promoting that narrative. I think it's, uh, so please, you know, please keep up the good work there. Oh, I will. I, 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 I agree with your point too. I, I, I think, you know, more and more countries are coming to that same conclusion. I, I was uh, honored to travel with the president to India just recently. And my counterpart there, Minister Padan, is a, you know, a good friend as well. We've had some very candid conversations about that. And, uh, you know, the enormous market that India presents for U.S. gas, you know, I, we just have to pursue. I mean, it, we would be uh, deaf, dumb, and blind not, not to pursue that opportunity on behalf of U.S. gas producers. But he also raised a good point. He said, you know, one of the things that, you know, is attractive to me is that, one, it is the United States. You do honor, you know, contract law. It's a very... Uh, he didn't say uh, non-risk. He's always risk when you put this much money on the table with regard to capital. But it's a much less risky proposition than perhaps buying from other countries that are not only adversaries to the United States, but in some cases adversaries to their national interests as well. Uh, but the other point he raised was interesting. We don't have destination clauses with our LNG. So if you buy, you know, U.S. LNG and it's on the open water and you change your mind, somebody else wants to pay more for the product you just bought, you're free to sell it. You can't get that from Qatar. You can't get that from some of the other nations that export LNG. And it just, you know, it reminded me that, yeah, this is a great place to do business and we've got great partners to do business with. So we're going to continue that advocacy. I just want to piggyback a little on what Andrew raised um, because indeed the export market, we, we continue to be extremely interested in the opportunity and the growth and appreciate the efforts uh, at the federal level. You know, I think though, um, the one place uh, I think we continue to see a challenge is that the expansion of those markets cannot, 
it's a very emotional issue still locally, right? We're convincing everybody that this is a good thing. And so, you know, data in my world still matters. I realize I'm in a minority in this group, uh, not in this group, but in the world um, about using data. But one of the things we've started to notice is helpful is when you do an analysis of a pipeline moving something versus a truck or a train, and you start to show the impacts on the environment, you can prove out the benefit of one over another. We would argue the same is true as you try, try to deal with greenhouse gas emissions, that exporting can actually assist our world in getting cleaner, faster uh, in its use of energy. And so the more we could use that kind of analysis as we talk about this issue and not just the economics of it, we think we can uh, start to address some of where we're feeling the greatest tension or at least um, reinforce that kind of narrative. And we think having the federal government really look at that as well and reinforce that's part of the decision I think is helpful. No, that's absolutely true. Um, that's absolutely true. Data does matter. And that's, you know, I know Mike and you know, his team in DC have done, I think, a great job of, you know, when we look at some of the recent court decisions, Atlantic Coast Pipeline, Dakota Access Pipeline, just making the point that, you know, that product will con continue to move. It's either going to go by rail or it's going to go by truck, but it's going to continue to move because the world depends on it and they will depend upon it for a very, very long time. You know, the Energy and uh, Information Administration, EIA, as we refer to it as part of the DOE, uh, tells us that we're going to be dependent upon, you know, fossil fuels as the primary source of energy for at least the next four or five decades, the primary source of energy. And that's something we have to acknowledge. And if, you know, if folks are sensitive about, you know, the, the emissions coming from, you know, certain parts of the world, be it India or China or others, then you would want to encourage to the maximum extent possible transitions to low carbon intense fuels and natural gas is a perfect one so right. why wouldn't we want to export this product around the world they're going to use it so thank you for that i i would like to to second that you know the the technical baseline you know they're, they're the geopolitics of energy they're mm -hmm. the geopolitics of of climate change it is, it is an emotional argument but data does have to you know be added to the discussion uh, and the EIA, the, the, the DOE is seen as an independent kind of uh, source of information by the rest of the world, you know, for these, for these, uh, for this data, you know, we're expanding a study uh, that was done by uh, University of Calgary, MIT, uh, SMU and Johns Hopkins. So some, some heavyweight universities that, you know, the baseline analysis uh, with modeling uh, that was peer reviewed. Uh, basically states that uh, U.S. LNG exported to Asia uh, can result, result in a 60% reduction in their emissions. And so that's just one study. There's, you know, frankly, we need, there's not a whole lot more out, the, uh, out there on the record. DOE has done some, some good work, and I, I would just recommend expanding that, partnering with universities, uh, you know, getting it peer reviewed and, and, you know, letting people poke holes on it because we think, it, we think we, you know, we can stand behind those facts. Uh, just in terms of our development. I, keep, I hate to keep hogging. The, oops, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, well, I was just going to, this is kind of an old horse, but I'm going to try to ride it, and I'm going to date myself a little bit. Back in my days with Williams Energy, uh, we did a lot of work on uh, natural gas-powered vehicles and propane-powered vehicles. There was tremendous support from the Department of Energy back in those days. Even the states, heck, I think I was even involved in the first legislation that allowed some tax credits for people to convert fleets. And today we've got Bluebird Bus Company, and we've got all these different companies that are still doing those things. But I don't know on a national scale whether or not there's been a, a continued effort uh, with, say, Ford Motor Company, and they've done some, Roush Racing has done some fantastic work with uh, different fuels. Uh, I don't know just exactly how much people would embrace that because it kind of, ramped its way up and then it just kind of fell, it kind of slowly fell apart because gasoline prices did not sustain themselves. So it dropped back down. I don't know if that's something that could be revisited. Uh, it's a great motor fuel source. The emissions are like 60% less than standard gasoline. Now we've chased that down quite a bit with some of the cafe standards, but uh, fleet fuels are still something that's, you know, if we can get the fleets to convert to something, because right now the EVs just don't make any sense for large vehicles. They just, it just doesn't. They're just the battery capacity, other things we could talk about. But if we could research some new ideas, 
I think the general public has no idea that the school bus their kids are running around in most, for most parts, especially in Colorado, are on propane. They don't even know. It just, it just has this little decal on the back and they have no clue. It's an incredibly safe fuel and it does the job and it helps in advance the natural gas use in the state of Colorado and other states around the nation. So it might be something for you guys to take a look at and see if there's anything there. I'd be happy to take a look at it. You know, when I was growing up in Louisiana, my grandfather was a farmer. He drove a propane powered pickup truck wherever you went, you know, as well as some of our tractors. I mean, we, we got very accustomed to that. I think, you know, when I was at Ford, we did some work uh, as well on natural gas, uh, you know, vehicles. I don't know exact, I don't have a perfect answer as to why it didn't, you know, progress. I know that there were issues around the distribution network and, and things like that. And it didn't take off quite as uh, aggressively as some had hoped. I think uh, as I look down the road, we're starting to see more and more interest in hydrogen and uh, you know, perhaps developing hydrogen sources from natural gas. Uh, we'll see where that goes. We have a project at DOE where we're gonna encourage some more research and development in this and see what we might do uh, to move it forward. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I think I, I couldn't agree more with, with all the points that were discussed. You know, that when we look at things, it's usually from a job focus. And uh, we, I think we've learned as a country that forcing uh, our youth all into a, a college track is, is just didn't work. There, there are certain folks that their natural skill set and ability isn't, isn't a good fit for a traditional education model like that. And the apprenticeship programs that can be found within the industry through the different trades uh, don't incur any student loan debt. And, and so it's really an opportunity for somebody to earn the career skills that they need to be successful throughout their life with, with no student loan debt. Our, our five-year apprenticeship program completes the apprentices. They pay a grand total of $1,000 out of pocket through the whole five years, 200 bucks a year uh, to help offset some of their book costs. Uh, and then they have access to a job that's, you know, six figures with good benefits. Uh, and it addresses, you know, a lot of the other challenges that, that you know, people in the country face, affordable housing and, and access to good health care. Well, if you have a good job with good benefits, th those things become much easier problems to solve. Uh, and so I think, you know, where we look at it is, is some of the hard times is, is that what everybody talked about. How do we get pipeline projects through the approval and permitting process? We're all very concerned about protecting the environment because our members live here in Colorado in both urban and, and rural areas. And they care about it because they live there and they, they like to enjoy the natural resources uh, that the outdoor industry and, and different things provide. Uh, so we don't we, we don't want to just rush things through, but providing some kind of level of, of certainty uh, so we don't have a bunch of workers sitting around waiting for a project to go. And whether it be replacing existing lines even, uh, which help address environmental concerns, uh, you know, the only way to move more product through a, a smaller line is to raise pressures. Uh, and we know, you know, what kind of, of challenges that presents and the product has to move. Uh, so, you know, any kind of certainty... Uh, that, that could be provided would be appreciated, I think, from both the business side and the labor side, both, both working together to be successful and ultimately address some, some environmental concerns, whether that be uh, through replacement of, of outdated lines, whether that means putting in new lines so different geographical areas have access to clean burning natural gas. Uh, we've done a lot of work at NREL, at the National Renewable Energy Laboratories, and completely understand the SIPL cycle and the peaker plants that go along with those renewable projects are critical to making them actually function correctly and provide energy uh, to, to those communities. So uh, on the LNG side, uh, we've worked with Andrew and, and very supportive of getting those facilities built. They're large facilities that provide tremendous opportunities. Uh, we had probably 2000 pipe fitters on Cove Point on the East Coast LNG for years and years and years. Uh, it was a great economic benefit to all those workers and long-term, it's not just short-term jobs. When you look at a five and 10 year long project where you have you know, thousands of workers and hundreds of apprentices, they get a chance to, to go through their entire apprenticeship and learn the skills needed to, to have a lifelong career. And, and that translates to vertical construction and all the different facets of the industry that provide those opportunities as well. Uh, so you know, we, we wanna address the, the environmental concerns I think we can do that by putting a lot of good American jobs uh, out there for folks to enjoy. Uh, we can get exports going to, to emerging countries. India and China are bringing on coal-fired power generation plants every day. 
Uh, and if we really want to be serious about reducing carbon emissions, uh, we can influence their policy, uh, their, their you know, legislative or, or political policy, but we can influence the market by putting a product out there at a price point that just makes sense for everybody. Uh, so we, we appreciate the support and, and uh, uh, enjoy the conversation continuing. No, thank thank you for that. I appreciate your points. You know, you, you, raise, you raise an important point too, though, about training and education. And Mike and I had a conversation about this just yesterday, or was it the day before? I can't remember which. We were in uh, at another event. But, you know, at DOE and at NREL in particular, you know, one of the things that concerns me as the secretary is making sure that we have access to educational programs that provide us with STEM talent. You know, so we need engineers, we need physicists, we need chemists, we need PhD scientists, you know, to, to do the R&D work at these national laboratories. And that's very important. And I want to continue to work on that. But it's never lost on me as well that we need trade. You know, we, we need vocational education as well. And sometimes I think we overlook that. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm reminded, you know, my own family, we have nine kids. For those of you who didn't, who don't know that, we have, we have a bunch of kids. My wife and I uh, are blessed with nine kids. And they're so remarkably different. Um, you know, my first two went off to college, graduated the top of their class, and are doing quite fine, you know, doing great. The next two came to me and said, Dad, we don't want to go to college. You know, and, and you know, I said, well, so what's your plan? And they're both opening up their own business. My son, you know, uh, apprenticed with a, a local company and learned a lot about commercial sprinkler systems and now is off on his own doing his own, you know, his own work. My daughter became a professional farrier because that's what she wanted to do. So she went to learn, you know, to a uh, blacksmithing school and uh, is doing quite well, you know, servicing racehorses. You know, it, it, and it just, it just reminded me that even within my own family, you know, that, you know, there isn't one path forward. There isn't one path to a successful career. It goes, you know, all over the map. In my own experience, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, I was talking to Ivanka Trump just recently about this because she's got a new program that's going to focus on this. You know, she's looking for people with non-traditional paths, you know, to, to their, their uh, you know, their ultimate career. I don't know if this is my ultimate career, but I've had a very non-traditional path, you know, getting to the point where I'm at today. And uh, I just think it's important that we remember that vocational training, trade training is just very, very important to us. Yeah. Um, just to piggyback off of what you just said, Mr. Secretary, I'm a vice chair of house education and I cannot overstate enough um, how important trade education is, uh, in particular to rural economic development. You know, there seems to be a tremendous disconnect almost uh, because we've had years and years and years at this point of I mean, I'm 30 years old and I grew up with this idea that you're going to get straight A's, you're going to go to college, that's the way it is, that's your ticket to the middle class. Um, frankly, I'm the oldest child, so I got the pleasure of being the guinea pig of my parents, and that's exactly what I did. I went to college, I accrued all kinds of student loan debt, and uh, I became a public school teacher. And my brother, on the other hand, the next child back from me, went to college, wasted two years, decided he didn't like it, became a welder, made more money his first year in the apprenticeship, I might add. I was so offended. In the apprenticeship than I did as a full, uh, fully fledged college graduate teacher, you know? Um, and I don't, I think of federal support of post-secondary education in the trades and in particular in community colleges, because frankly, we see these community colleges doing a much better job of linking, um, you know, what basically our industry, whatever neck of the woods that is here in Colorado, um, to good jobs, just because they're responding to those, that market demand. And frankly, that's, there's definitely a lot of room for more support at the federal level uh, for community colleges. I think you're absolutely right. So one of the things I've been adamant about with regard to our national laboratories, and you know, uh, I'm going to call out one in particular, they're all doing a great job, but I'll just give you one quick example. Uh, in Idaho, we have the Idaho National Laboratory. It's, a, it's one of the world's preeminent uh, nuclear science laboratories. And uh, you know, you would think right off the top of your head, well, you got to be a PhD to work at INL. You got to be a nuclear engineer. You got to be, and we have one here. I don't know where he is. Ben Rinke, Dr. Ben Rinke behind me. Uh, so no offense, Ben. 
Ben earned his PhD from uh, the Ohio State University in nuclear engineering. Go Bucks! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> to say that for Mike. <laughs> but um, you know, you, you would think that that's that's the training you need. And uh, Mark Peters is the lab director there. Mark's been very keen on this. The community college, the local community college system, produces. Uh, what he needs perhaps most on any given day, and that's rad techs. It's people who understand the seminars and, and the basics of nuclear science and can help them each and every day accomplish the larger mission of the laboratory. And he's worked very closely with the community college system there to produce that type of talent and that pipeline. Oh, Mr. Secretary, I'd, I'd love to get your feedback on what you started some of your remarks with. Uh, you had uh, something along the lines of what can I do to help you know, perhaps it's a new um, regulatory issue or perhaps it's just us getting out of the way. And I'm curious, uh, I was reading some of your remarks that you had made at a, at a previous event talking about how the free markets play such an interesting role in innovation, particularly in the energy space, and was struck by the fact that government can play uh, a role and should. What we've seen in Colorado is probably an over, um, overzealous role of government in the regulatory environment for oil and gas. And that's been detrimental, as Lynn can attest to, for the companies that produce here in Colorado. But we've seen maybe a little bit um, you know, of a different approach at the federal level. So I'd love to just get your approach to what the government's role should be at the federal level. What advice would you have for us at the state level? And I think it's more kind of big picture principles sure. um, with private markets, um, the ideas of companies being the true innovators, uh, and sort of along those lines. Would love to sure. Feedback. So a, a couple of quick examples. I mean, um, this industry has done remarkable things with horizontal drilling and, and fracking, you know, in certain parts of the country. Those technologies began at the, at the Department of Energy. Now, you took them to levels, you know, we could not imagine. But, you know, the, the initial technologies were developed in Department of Energy laboratories. I think that's our role. Our, our role is to help fund some of the R&D, to maybe conduct some of the R&D that can't be borne by private industry in every case. And then once we can do that, once we've developed the R&D to a point where we think it might be commercially valuable, we have an obligation to push it out into the marketplace and to let commercial companies take it. And in my view, I mean take it with some de minimis amount of you know, cost to them. The American taxpayer has already paid for the R&D. So, you know, you own it. It's yours. As taxpayers, you own it. So I don't know why it should sit on a shelf at one of my laboratories. We need to get it out. We need to get it out to you so that you can take it to that level that we can't begin to understand today. So that's, that's just, that's the approach that I have as the secretary with the things that I have. I'll give you just another practical example of the regulatory approach that we've taken. Um, you know, if you wanted uh, just recently, is is you know, recently is two years ago. If you wanted to build a small LNG export facility, you began the process by coming to us at DOE and getting what was known as a public interest certificate. That allowed you to go to FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and actually get the permit that you were looking for. And then you would come back to DOE for the final authorization. And then you could go about the business of investing your, your capital. My predecessor, Rick Perry, a very, uh, a very good man and somebody I've known a long time and uh, respect very deeply, uh, asked me what I thought was probably the most profound question that I had heard in, in government when he was the secretary and I was then the deputy secretary. He said, Dan, he said, um, economic interest, he said, is it ever, is it ever in the economic interest of the United States to not create jobs and not create economic activity? And I said, no. He said, well, then why is this a requirement? Why would they come to us to get approval and demonstrate economic interest? It's clearly in the economic interest if people want to put their money at risk and create jobs. I said, you know, you're absolutely right. We're going to get rid of that today. And we did. You know, it's just, it's a very simple thing. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's that simple thing that we overlook. It's the obvious that we miss sometimes in these conversations. And, uh, you know, while not, I'm not going to suggest that was a silver bullet and fixed, you know, all of the issues. Nonetheless, there are millions of dollars that are spent every year on legal fees just obtaining the economic interest from DOE. So taking that step away is going to save some, 
you know, some money. But that's the regulatory approach that we want to take at the federal level. And to the extent that I can impart that on state regulators, as I mentioned earlier, I was one, uh, I will continue to do that because I think it's important that we do that. Um, we have to get out of the way of this economic development. We, we cannot get out of the way, however, in certain areas, like we mentioned nuclear engineering and nuclear science. You know, public safety is an important area for us, and we want to be responsible, you know, as we look at these regulations. But when it comes to economics, you will do a much better job. You will determine a heck of a lot faster than I will where you should put your money and whether or not you're going to get a return. So I just need to get out of your way. Yeah, I would like to just interject. I mean, us in the Permian are in a lot better shape than the folks in Colorado. I mean, we wind up, it's a thing where fortunately most of our major projects for takeaway both of oil and natural gas are through Texas, which virtually has no federal lands. Uh, it has a state climate that's more adaptive uh, to oil and gas and to pipelines and recognizing the benefits of those. Uh, we actually have excess capacity today uh, that is in place uh, for takeaway if activity were to actually come back. In fact, there's a debate right now between some of our larger companies as to whether we'll ever actually utilize all of the capacity in the future uh, or be short of capacity. But uh, it's really a unique place. Uh, truly, it's a thing where I know API is working constantly to try to help educate the population on the benefits because obviously uh, in the last couple of years when our development just exploded, uh, we saw huge differentials in price which then affected the economics of projects. Uh, we had situations and obviously regulatory stuff can just be a disaster. You know, our state's in the middle of an emissions uh, policy at the government level currently and as a small operator, our largest emissions by our company, in fact, 90% of our total emissions in the last 10 years have resulted from a lack of right away for the BLM for over a six month period in an area of high development that was a parallel of a, an existing pipeline project and it only amounted to less than a, a quarter mile of BLM in a six mile project but they held it up for an extended period of time and every operator out there was flaring or venting gas during that six month period. And those are the, the challenges. And I mean, I, well, I guess I'm really thankful I'm not an operator in Colorado because of the challenges that you all have in this state. But unfortunately, New Mexico is becoming more and more like uh, Colorado. Uh, and I hope that uh, there is logic and the ability to educate our population to the real benefits and the fact that they, they recognize not. I mean, uh, every day what we produce has less emissions than any barrel of oil or any MCF of gas produced anywhere else in the world. And as a result, they should be encouraging us to supply, as you stated, the fuel that is necessary no matter how much renewables are developed, there will still be a need for this fossil fuel for a good period of time. But it's, it's a hard message to sell when the population doesn't uh, live in the producing areas and basically are listening to the messages uh, of a small group of uh, what we call crazies. But anyway, it's a thing where I, I wish you the best because, and your administration, certainly we've seen tremendous uh, changes at the Department of Interior in the way things have been handled and uh, they've certainly been positive on our landscape. When uh, Bush was president, the uh, leader of the Bureau of Land Management came from Washington and told us all of the great things. They were turning the ship of the BLM. I left the meeting and I says, do they realize that every field specialist at the Carlsbad BLM is the anchor that they just threw over the side of the ship? They may have turned the heading different but they didn't move the ship an inch closer to their direction, and that was the case. But this administration has certainly made a, uh, a much more positive move to try to uh, change and actually give opportunities for us to continue the development, and we thank you for that. I would, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you jump right in. Okay, I was gonna ask you one more policy type question. And I, I meant to do this earlier, I apologize. I, we had the recent trade war that took place, Saudis, Russia, 
drove the oil prices in the tank, as we all have heard multiple times. Uh, there's a lot of companies that have gone bankrupt now that we are aware of. I think there's about 15 here in Colorado that have filed Chapter 11 or 7. Um, what steps are you all taking to prevent an additional trade war? Because we don't want that thing to rear, rear its ugly head twice, right? Because it, it really did hurt the, the producers around the country. Maybe you could give us a little insight on what the department's doing. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, matter of fact, I just got off the phone with my counterpart in Saudi Arabia just last week. We're probably gonna meet again in another week. Uh, we're preparing to, he, uh, the Saudi Arabians chair the G20 this year. So we're gonna be meeting in September to have some additional conversations, not only about uh, energy production, but other issues as well. But obviously my portfolio is energy. You know, the situation between the Saudis and the Russians was very acute in March and April. The president directed me at that time to uh, engage at my level, the ministerial level, uh, to see what we might do to resolve the situation between the two parties. We made some good progress for about three or four weeks. And I imparted upon the Saudis in particular uh, the damage that they were doing to the U.S. industry. Uh, got very tense at times, no question about that. And at some point during that process, it dawned on me that, you know, uh, this was only going to get resolved at the head of state level. So I called the president. I talked to him about what we were doing. He said, fine. So we're gonna, I'm going to call Putin and I'm going to call the king of Saudi Arabia and we're going to work this out. And he did. The president obviously has many more levers, levers to, to pull than I do. Um, and he did. He pulled every single one of them, as a matter of fact. And uh, you know, as a result, they were able to work out their disagreements and we ended up with uh, a reduction in their supply to the world market of approximately 10 million barrels per day, which helped to stabilize the market at the same time, you know, at that time. The president also directed me to open up the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because as you guys know, we're right at the beginning of that pandemic, which we didn't fully appreciate, to be honest, at that point in time. I don't think anyone knew exactly what was going to happen here. But as the economies began to shut down, and properly so in many cases, that demand curve just fell off the end of the table. And then we hit, you know, that created the double whammy. We had the you know, lack of, of demand for refined products like gasoline and diesel and jet fuel. Production continued at the same level for a period of time because it's harder to shut these things off once they start. You know, storage became an acute issue. Uh, the president opened, uh, directed me to open up the, the strategic, strategic petroleum reserve, which I did. And we took in some barrels of oil uh, to help alleviate that. It wasn't a silver bullet, not going to pretend it was, but it was an important step to take for the industry, and we did it. Um, all that being said, I think we're in a good place right now with you know, both the Saudis and the Russians, because now it's apparent to everyone that this pandemic has caused a collapse in demand all around the world. So if anybody thought that they were gonna take market share from someone else as a result of you know, reducing their prices or increasing their production, you can think again. There just isn't enough demand you know, to go around to do that. So I think everybody understands clearly where we are. Uh, I will continue this conversation with the Saudis. We understand the impact it's made, especially to you know, many of the independents in the Permian uh, here in Colorado. Uh, it's in a very acute uh, problem for them. Um, that being said as well, I'm also aware of the fact that many of these people got into the oil business thinking it might be a little easier than it actually was. Uh, and I'm gonna be honest about that. I mean, a lot of folks went to Wall Street, borrowed a lot of money, uh, thinking they were gonna make a, a fast dollar down in Texas or New Mexico or Colorado, North Dakota, Oklahoma, pick a state, Louisiana. Um, it's not an easy business. And you know, it's something that uh, they're learning some hard lessons. So some of those folks are gonna go away as a result of the free market process. And that's, you know, while hard and painful, uh, that's the system that we have here in the United States. We, we, we don't belong to OPEC for a reason. And uh, we're not a communist nation for a reason. And uh, as painful as that may be, you know, we're going to have to to accept that. Uh, the important thing for us as an administration, and I know the president is very, very uh, keen on this, is that we have to begin to appropriately reopen the economy and create the demand curves for these products. And as we do that, um, this industry is going to come back on the other side of this pandemic, perhaps even stronger than it was pre-pandemic. Mr. Secretary, I know you have a tight schedule here, so I want to thank you for all of the time that you've uh, given us today. Uh, I think as you can see from this incredible roundtable, the knowledge about this industry and about the importance of this industry for the state uh, is incredible. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to share with you 
the importance of this industry in Colorado for jobs and wages um, and economic development. So I want to thank uh, our, our elected officials in particular for uh, their attendance today. And uh, we're so excited to work with you and your department to continue to advance the American energy revolution. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for letting me join you today.